we're going to call it a quick day here. So we're kind of adding on to what we learned in the last chapter. It's kind of giving us more steps to go through when... Uh, so first you identify everything as here's what the skill is, here's how the person swings or shoots or kicks or whatever. So this one's going to be about identifying and correcting those errors uh, and giving you some steps to do that. So when, let's see, when we finish the lesson, there we go. So last chapter, we had six steps for analyzing someone's step, uh, techniques. Uh, Oh, that you know, it's always more fun to have the kids out for examples. See, there was a nice Wilson basketball in there. All right, I'm going to keep that out here. All right, so this time we're going to talk about different ways of identifying and correcting the skills that you have identified. So using the knowledge of everything that we've learned with all the different sport mechanics um, is how we're going to use that analysis. So here's the five steps that we're going to add to this. So use your knowledge of sport mechanics is number three. It's probably the biggest one there is what's going to be the difference. So first thing you need to do is observe the complete skill. So the preferred approach is to watch the whole skill. So if I'm going to watch somebody swing a golf club, I'm going to stand there, just kind of stand probably behind them because it's probably on a driving range, and I'm going to watch them swing. I'm going to see how good a swing they have. I have to swing, I have to swing away from the driver. And that's why I stand underneath this thing. I'm not worried about whacking the computer or anything. So what do you need to consider when observing a Sports skill. You should have done six things, so tell the person next to you two of them. Go! All right, so here's what the computer says to do. So first thing you want to do is make sure everybody's in a safe spot for observing. Uh, I have gotten more injuries spotting things than I have actually doing things. So I've done a lot of, I did 11 years of um, Adventist gymnastics, which would be like Cirque du Soleil cheerleading kind of mixed together. Uh, and I spent more time getting whacked by people falling than I did actually doing any of those skills over the years that I've been around it. So then you want to choose a setting for the observation. So are you going to go take and work in a 40 mile an hour wind outside for somebody's jump shot? Probably not. So you'd probably try to find a good setting controlled environment probably as best you can uh, for that observation. So as I say, you, you want to do it, is it going to be in competition or are you going to do it during practice time? I like the controlled environment if possible, uh, is when I'm trying to analyze somebody's sports skills. Then we got to think about your positioning during that observation. Uh, do you want to just stand in one spot? you think you can get everything from one position? Most of the time, no. I can get a lot on a jump shot by watching somebody from underneath the basket rebounding for them. But eventually, I'm going to have to go to their dominant hand side because I want to see where is that elbow pointing from uh, being next to them. So making sure you have, know that positioning there. So you want to observe the performance of the skill. That's going to be, did they accomplish what they're supposed to accomplish? Did they make the shot? Did they hit? it nice and straight onto the green, or did they slice it off to Kathmandu? Uh, there's just uh, different options there. And then you're gonna look for any clues. This is where I would be looking for, is something like blaringly wrong with this technique compared to what I know? You know, if somebody's swinging a golf club, you, they should be coming from the inside towards the ball. So you wanna come from this direction. Most people play softball or baseball, 
And on their way through, they're going to throw the club way out here, right, and yank it across their body. Right. Am I seeing something immediately that just like seems like it's going to throw them off and is going to make it not work at all? I'm going to say, most of the time when I start, I'm either going to, as a golf coach, I'm going to stand right behind them to start, and then I will probably go face side, whichever way they're facing, and watch from that direction. Usually from there I'm watching as their head's swinging, is, is they're getting a proper weight shift that I can see. Um, when it comes to basketball, I usually have them shoot elbow jumpers. And so I'll have them shoot elbow jump over here, I'll have them move to the second spot, elbow jumper there, and go back and forth. Uh, to start my observing the whole skill. And then I'm going to move to their dominant hand side uh, in order to see that. Now, basketball or jump shots and golf are pretty easy because they actually don't move. They generally stay in the same place. If you're going to have something where somebody is moving while doing it, you're going to have to be, have more positions in order to see it. If you're doing somebody's sprinting technique, uh, you're going to have immediately on the blocks. You're going to be a couple steps down. You're going to be a few more steps down because you want to see how the rise comes up as they're starting the run. Uh, gymnastics here, this would be the vault. So where they, you know, are they going straight at it? There are definitely people that when they do their round off, they actually skip to one side and then put their hands down on this side of the line. That's always an easy Something's wrong there, and that especially on something like this, that can compound to somebody going completely sideways. So that's not, that's not cool. Uh, where they hit the, the block here, where they hit the pommel, and then where they land, all those are different ones. So you're going to have to watch this skill five different times. You're not going to be able to probably watch it one time. I really liked you guys in some of our labs uh, when we were doing the disc golf one, how you had three different people record the same throw. Because then at least you could see, otherwise you'd have to record it three different times and you could have made three different mistakes on three different throws from three different angles. Uh, so that I thought was pretty good. Um, hurdling, so same thing, when they're in a moving line you're going to have to do more positions in order to see it. Uh, if you're watching like a whole team, so let's say you're watching a team play defense uh, in soccer, you're going to have to go to you know, behind the goal, you're going to have to do from midfield, you're going to have to go from the sides, watching the whole play, uh, just to make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, I'm thinking, that, am, I, am I doing that right? I'm not quite as familiar on soccer. Like, are those kind of the spots you would watch defense from? You wouldn't go down to, like, the corners or anything like that? Okay. I just know that's what I would do for basketball. I was just kind of moving it over there. So then you're going to analyze each phase and its key elements. So this is why you know all that preferably before you go into correcting someone. You know what the point of the game is. You know the basic positions. Uh, one of you guys had a really good detailed, I think it was yours, that had all the different positions for land. Like There were like eight or nine positions for jumping. And I'm like, that's a really good one. I'm stealing that and putting it into the one for next year. Uh, just to give you phases to look at. Uh, so then you would start, uh, after you've watched the whole skill, so if I'm doing basketball with somebody, so I'm going elbow to elbow, I then I'm going to watch. I generally work backwards, so I'm going to have them shoot and I'm going to watch, rather than pay attention if it goes in or not. So we did set, fire, and hold were the three things we did. So I'm going to watch their finish first. Does they're finished? Do they keep their hands up? Do they drop them like Michael Jordan? Are they spun out to the side? I'm looking at all those things for a couple of shots. Then I'm going to watch where they get their set position. Do they set it here? Do they set it here? Do they do a little dip thing? You know, they do. Everybody does something a little different. So I'm watching their set position next. That's the one I'll almost always have to go to the side to make sure. And then I'm going to watch um, their fire. You know, are they releasing the ball when their feet come off the ground? Are they going in sequence? A lot of people tend to take like the ball up first and then jump. Like somebody did that earlier, yeah. Uh, rather than going all at one time. You guys actually as a whole did pretty good on that one uh, compared to a lot of classes that I've taught and teams that I've taught. So I already kind of talked about that. So. Generally, one, at least one shot, I'm going to catch, check each phase. 
Um, and I might even have them catch and then stop for their uh, set phase because I want to see where are their hands exactly on the ball. Um, you can see that fairly quickly, but it's better just like toss it to them and freeze. And I'm just going to run over, check their dominant hand, and then I'm going to check where they're holding the ball. So as they're going, after I watch the whole thing, then you start watching individual phases as they continue performing the skill. Uh, so observe each phase of that skill generally. Um, so it depends on what you're working on. Say I'm doing basketball and golf. If I'm looking at golf, I'm going to look at their head first, then I'm going to look at their shoulders, then their hips, then their hands, and then the club. So I'll probably work top down on that. So then here's where you get to your using everything you've learned in this class. So after you've watched all the different phases that you already identified, then you're going to observe each of those phases again and using your knowledge of sport mechanics. So the first thing I would probably be checking, are they in balance? Somebody's swinging a golf club. So hit anything. So with a swing, and they go and fall back like this. That tells me they don't have a stable base. They're going to be really hard to be consistent if they don't have a stable base. If I'm watching somebody shoot a jump shot, and they shoot, and they are jumping sideways as they shoot. They're probably going to be missing to the left all the time. That's just knowing physics. If I jump sideways, that otherwise they're going to have to be like flinging the ball sideways backwards against it in order to do that. Uh, in the video we had the other day, uh, when someone's swimming, are they doing it? Are they, is the main force at the top or is it at the bottom of their swim stroke? Looking for those kinds of things. Is the force at the beginning or at the end? So the okay, first thing I would always seem to check is stability. You know, then are they using the correct muscles that they need to use? A lot of people like you guys tried to swing a golf club without using your wrists. So are they using the right muscles? Are they using the right sequence? Are they bringing the ball up first and then jumping? Are they flinging the club out in front of them and then pulling it, which is what most people do? Uh, is the athlete applying force uh, with the muscles in the correct sequence? Kind of already said that. That's what we got here. Are they applying the right amount of muscular force at the appropriate time? Uh, you'll notice that in golf. I don't know if I can do anything here without making you hit something. But you'll hear the whoosh of the club will happen after they hit the ball. So they're applying force, applying force, applying force, and that whip finishes at the very end. So sometimes you'll even use audio cues to notice what if they're doing the right amount of force at the right time. If the force is going before the ball, so you hear the whip, you pop, then it's probably the wrong sequence for golf at least. So after you yeah, say, then after you've observed everything, say we've already kind of talked these, is the force going the right direction? Are they throwing it over the top? Are they coming too far inside? Are they riding the amount of torque? Like are they even using their hips? Uh, I remember watching a thing of Tiger Woods, probably when he was just had got, he won the Masters the first time, and he took, he got on the golf course. Oh yeah, I used to do the old lay swing. I'm like, what? You know, yeah, swing like this, and then you fire your hips. Well, hey! I don't know why I would remember that one, but he definitely was trying. He, he's like, that's what I did when I was 14, 15, and 16. When I was super flexible to get more powers, I could get more torque on the club by throwing my hips out of the way to get more power on the ball. So then you're going to be looking at, are they rotating correctly in the correct positions? Are they pulling in at the right times? And a little more of our opposite reaction here when you watch those little old ladies when you're swim, having that 6 a.m. swim lifeguarding. As they pull one side, their hips go to another, and their legs go around here. Hopefully, they stay on the top of the water. Some of them don't. That gets a little scary. Then comes the hardest part, I think. You have to then select what needs to be fixed first. Because you'll be able to look at each one of those sequences and be like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And you probably have a list in your head of six or seven things that are going wrong in that, I'm going to say, jump shot or golf swing. Now you have to pick which one is the first thing to fix. 
Uh, so that can change a lot uh, depending on what you're doing. Uh, so you have to have like, which are the major errors? And you have to kind of categorize them in your head. I got six or seven things. What are the major things? What are minor? Uh, so then the underlying rule of de when determining errors is focusing on the ones that can be modified today. Like by the time I'm done with this shooting session or range session, what can I fix today? Uh, in a PT setting, when you're watching somebody walk and they got a weird limp, what muscles do I need to in, to make stronger and or for this person to walk out of here being able to walk better? Uh, so you'll have to use other knowledge of that you'll get beyond this, but this process is still the same. Uh, I have a note here. Not overloading your athletes. When you have something for them to fix, you only give them a couple things at a time. If they excel at those, then you can give them more. If not, you'll probably need to say, here are the couple things I want you to fix today, and when we come back, I have more for you. And once they correct the first thing, so I'd be having them. I know that in basketball, at least biomechanically speaking, if somebody shoots with their feet off to that side, going this direction, they're probably going to be following through with their hand this way. So I'm going to tell them, so today I want you to work on having both toes pointed at the hoop. And then you just wait and see how much do they correct on their own. Because now they will start following through more straight because their hips are not rotating as they're shooting. When you come back the next time, you're like, all right, how, mu how much have they fall slipped back to what they were doing before? And if you're going to correct that one, all right, now we're going to work on your grip today and change that. Uh, and just kind of don't overdo it. Because you could tell them to do, oh, yeah, I want you to correct your feet. I want to correct your hair. I want this hand to be going straight up in the air. And they're going to be it's just going to go over their head. So be real cautious of not doing too much um, in one session. All right, so we're going to watch this one. This is my old team. That's the gym I was in before I came here. It's actually a really nice gym. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Ready. Ready, boom. <laughs> and nobody hit the ground. Hey, Let's what did I tell you? What I tell you? Hit the ground. <laughs> All right. Most of you probably are not gymnasts. So, what's the first glaring thing that needs to be fixed? You're on the mechanics side. Before you correct the flip, what needs to be fixed? Hmm? They need to do it safely. She came down head first. We need to add more spotters. We need to do something else. Uh, this girl was not ready to be out of the belt. Generally, there is a belt that people would be in bunch ahead here. So generally speaking, I would have them in a belt like this. Now there's me running the belt. We'll come to those back to those in a minute. So the first thing you want to do is make sure they are safe before they try it. So whatever thing you're working on, uh, who was it? It was JT yesterday. I'm like, can I video you from in front and not get hurt? And so I'm like ducking down and holding the phone up there because I didn't want him to whack me in the head. I did, this is a bad PE teacher story. So years I've been doing volleyball and I'd have them line up on the 10 foot line facing towards the service line. And I would stand behind the serve and I'd show them the steps to serve. And I'm like, and then you do it like this. And then I would just hit it over their heads. Well, after I've been doing it for, oh, I think this has been my fifth year or fourth year teaching, I hit it. And it went off of the heel of my hand right into this girl's face. Yep, that was not my brightest decision. So she was fine, by the way. Her mom was even in the gym watching it, and she laughed. <laughs> the, the gym had the cafeteria was like oh, right there. So she was in the gym, and she saw it happen. And she went, <gasps> and then the girl got up, and she, the mom was over there just like... <laughs> 
I don't know if she was laughing at the kid or at me, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but ensuring safety is the first thing when it comes to any corrections that need to be made. If you're going to make corrections on somebody's swing, uh, whether they're playing softball, baseball, make sure everybody's in a safe location first. Um, then you take steps in that error correction. So in that gymnastics case, I would have put that girl back into the belt and had them toss a few more times until she was almost over rotating the, the twist or the flip. And then I, that's where I would have said you need to tuck sooner, you need to tuck tighter, because she basically did kind of a half twist thing. She didn't even barely, barely tuck at all. She just kind of threw her head back and hoped. Uh, so I would then take all my error correction there. Communicate different ideas, and you're going to have to come up with different ways of describing the exact same thing. Just a spoiler alert. Uh, I remember going to a couple of gymnastics clinics that we would do, and they called it the power of the polo. So these people would be there from National Cheer Association, and they'd have these polos on. I could tell my gymnast to do this over and over and over again, and this person with this blue polo on could tell them the exact same thing, and they'll be like, okay, I'll do it, and then it works. And you're like, Sometimes it just takes a different person to tell them something different. That's why it's not necessarily a good thing to coach your kids because it's be coming from your dad or coming from your coach comes a little, comes out a little bit differently. Uh, my mom is a person that you would have to come up with a different way. We call them Alana-isms. That's my mom's first name because I would have to describe it differently to her than to anybody else I knew. It was annoying. It was like, Mom, grab the club like... You know, interlock your fingers. What's that mean? Cross your fingers? What? Uh, do I do two of them or one of them? I'm just like, can you just watch? Something simple like that. And you just never, as it might be because your athlete's nervous, uh, or they're just perfectionists. That's my mother. Uh, so just being able to correct and communicate well, first of all, and then in different ways if necessary. And then use outside sources to aid in that correction, whether it's that other coach that has a pretty blue polo on or video so they can actually see it themselves. So ensuring safety when you're doing high risk things is huge. Using the maximum amount of spotters possible. Uh, begin with uh, any accomplished fundamental skill before moving on to the next one. Uh, I did a lot of trampoline work in my gymnastics days. And my favorite thing was wall walking. I didn't tell somebody to just put their feet on the wall, fall down on their back. I had them lay with their back on the ground, put their feet up, hands up in the air, and I call it the dead cockroach position. And then you'd have to pull your knees and hands in and start bouncing just so they could get used to the fundamental feeling of bouncing straight up. Then they had to bounce and go towards the wall because you'd be amazed how many people would just fall and go straight up and then they're trying to reach the wall and they're just like, ah, can't do it. So you make sure they can do the fundamental skills before they go on to more complex uh, things. Like that video there, that girl was had not completed the fundamental skill in order to do the skill that she was about to do. Uh, and then you would progressively remove spotters. So this is called a three high. This is something you won't see in most cheerleading competitions because it's illegal. But in Adventist gymnastics, we do lots of them. So in this case, uh, we have a spotter here. We have one here. There's actually one behind there you can't see. There's a person standing right here in the middle that's holding on. And the belt is actually spotting the top person. And so usually before something goes up like this, I would give assignments. I'm like, all right, you three are watching the middle. Everybody else is watching the top. And I don't like it. I've seen teams that would use like 20 people to spot one pyramid. I don't like that because then you have too many people like, oh, I thought you were going to catch her. I thought you were going to catch her. So you would be like, you've got off the front. You've got off the side. You've got off that side. You've got off the back. And one person has the middle. We're just going to trust the middle to jump off if it goes wrong. Because usually that was one of your better athletes who'd already been in a lot of two eyes. And if it went wrong, you just expect them to fall on their feet because it's more dangerous for the person on top. So eventually, you would then, so this would be like step one here. Step two, you would take them out of the belt and you would reassign everybody to different assignments for spotting. And then eventually you would start taking more and more people out of it. 
So you can kind of see here, again, we have the person in the belt. Uh, we have a spotter in the front, spotter in the front, spotter in the front. This person's ready to catch, and these are actually spotting the two in the middle at the moment. And then eventually we would take them out of the belt, and then we wouldn't really spot these two hardly at all. We'd put one person on them. So here's what that would look like, the whole oh, thing, just to give you an idea. As you can tell, they are not too great at it right now. Nine this shirt, bro. I think I even call for spotters here. There it is. Everybody during COVID. Spotters. Logan. You put your hands under his feet. Help you get up. Come on, come on, come on. There you go. Need a little more boost. Oh my goodness. That was a little crazy. Come on, come on. Come on. Ready? Ready. Boom. Down. Nice. That guy ended up doing a, one of those on top of a three high. So he was the fourth person doing that same motion up higher. The dude only weighed like maybe 85 pounds. Super skinny, but super strong. Uh, he's on Gym Masters. This guy's on Gym Masters now. I, this guy will try out next year, so will this guy. So like, there's a bunch of these guys that are going to be doing college gymnastics here shortly. But that gives you the idea of when you're doing high-level stuff, you need to have lots of spotting going on uh, to do so safely. So there's my uh, be safe speech for today. So here's kind of just the basic steps here. So step-by-step -step sequence. So separate the phases uh, that contain an error from the rest of the skill if you can. So if you can have them in golf, go to that position and hold. Um, halfway down, trying to, that's the one I do a lot because I always tell you people tend to throw the club over the top and swing. So I would have them go to the top and then I'd have them go, I'd come touch your elbow to your hip all the way down. So I do this drill. I had you guys, did I have you guys do the three pump drill when we were doing basketball? I don't think we had that much time where I'd have you start, I'd go from here, forehead, oh, yeah. belly button, forehead, that's isolating the steps, uh, if possible. So those were the key elements I was wanting you to do. So then you break the phase and its elements into even smaller parts if possible. Uh, then you would design a practice or specific activity, line shooting. Uh, that's useful for teaching the correct movement. Uh, I don't usually, at least in basketball, I don't have them shoot slowly. Throwing, I don't have them shoot slowly because they're more of a discrete movement where it's kind of like got to go quickly. So I generally wouldn't slow down that. Golf, on the other hand, I would have them slow their swing down. Rather than hitting at 100%, I want you to swing at 50% speed and see how far or if you can control it that way. Uh, I definitely did a lot of like 25 to 50 percent swings where you're purposely trying to slice it or draw. Uh, that was a drill we did in our college teams. Uh, let's say, then you do the whole skill at a reduced speed, progressively increase speed, increase effort. Let's say golf is a pretty good one for that. Next one would be using technology. Let's say we've done a fair amount of that and the technology is getting way easier because what we've got in our pockets can do more than what I could even do when I first started teaching. I remember my first swimming class that I went and observed uh, for a physical education class, and this gal had a big old tape recorder. Uh, it was at least a palm one, but she would record them swimming, and then she would have them come out, and she then would just plug the thing into a tube TV that she had rolled in there and have them watch themselves swim. I'm like, that's brilliant. Now I use that with an iPad for, let's say, volleyball. I would set it on the service line. And as they're working on and I found an app that would show it four times in a row in four different spots. So we'd be like one and then this one. So they could watch their skill four times. So whoever was closest, I'd have them serve, hit, and then they would walk around and watch themselves in that kind of four sequence thing. And it would just continually keep running there and the next person the next person i'll do the same thing with jump shots uh so there's just there's all kinds of ways to do that um and the more uh things you find let me know because i want to know more got another one for you in a few minutes 
So I would use uh, the other one. You can do this from distance. Uh, I, I've had gymnasts from my last school that have sent me videos and said, why can't I get my tumbling pass to work? Why can't I get my back tuck to work? And I'm giving them, I'm just recording on my phone, drawing on the screen saying, here's how I would fix it. And then they'll send me a video back a couple days later and say it worked or it didn't work. Um, I've had uh, basketball players over the summer send me their jump shots, have me critique it from wherever they were. And that was especially in boarding school days where they're going to be two, three hours away from me. Here, I would just tell them, go meet me in the gym. So communicating ideas uh, for that. So translating your mechanical know-how into instructions uh, that fit the age. So if they're elementary or high school, maybe they're elderly and don't know don't know much about it. Uh, their amount of intelligence and whatever their physical ability is, uh, you're always going to have to be able to correct that no matter what field you're in, whether it's therapy or coaching or teaching. It's always going to have to be able to translate what you know into things that they can. Because if you start talking about torque to a second grader, they're going to be like, huh? My son's favorite phrase right now. Anytime he doesn't like something you say, like, all right, it's time to go get your bath and go to bed. Huh? It's time to go to bed. Huh? And then he gives you that little grin like, I know what you said, but I didn't hear you. Yeah, he's at that age. Uh, athletes are much different. They'll respond to different cues. I kind of already talked about that. Sometimes you have to say it multiple ways so that they will understand. Uh, I definitely have a, I have, I've had to work on this over the years. Being uh, short, easy to understand instructions. I can go into all the details of why the sh jump shot's not working. But when I teach it, I need to do short, quick, easy to understand things and then let them try that phase or that section as quick as possible. I used to teach shooting in three days and I've got it down to just over one. Like I can do it in, in like a, a 50 minute class period. Uh, you guys, I, I rush through it to get it through the whole thing. But like when you're teaching high schoolers, you have to go slower. When you do it with middle schoolers, you have to go even slower. Uh, then uh, coming up with outside sources is something I've already kind of made you guys do when you're coming up with your theoretical models. Coming up with different ways, uh, coaching seminars, uh, sports science workshops. If you can find those, those are really cool. Any kind of technology. Uh, so yeah, there's kind of it all in a nutshell there. If you want to take a picture of that. That's kind of the whole thing in a... All right, so I used to use an app called Coach's Eye. It would let you draw on it. It would let you track things. Uh, my favorite thing is it would let you put two videos on there at once. So I've got, I still got the, the app on my phone, and but it doesn't let me use it hardly anymore because they just don't support it anymore. But the videos are still like stored in the cloud apparently or on my phone, I'm not sure which. Uh, so I found something that was really close and at least Briefly is free. I don't know if it's a like you got it for a week or if it always will work, but most of you are going to be doing your studies next week. Uh, so I'm actually going to let you try again with your, if you so desire, if you want to try your analysis from yesterday uh, using this because you can record and talk and draw at the same time. So here's kind of what this looks like. And I did this while trying, my, my son and my wife were both asleep this morning when I found this, so I, I, I'm talking really quiet. All right, so we've got a new app here called Seams Up, and I'm kind of liking this because it's got this kind of scroll that's a little easier. You can't see the bottom um, where you can What I really slide. like is it's got a tracking for joints. So let's get it was lowest position here. And then you got your drawing angles. Can I move this one? Yeah, 
interesting. So just another app here. My other favorite part of this. Here we go. So we can add a second one here. I don't know if he actually even jumps. But we can separate them by tapping one. You can one like link them and together and do them at the same one. time. Tap on the other one, do this one. We can even darken it so much that we can't even see anything except the skeletons. So good ideas here. So that's something I want you guys to play around with. If you want to redo that one from yesterday, I'm going to reopen it uh, to be due tonight. And yeah, give that a shot and say, I don't know if it's, I didn't see anything on there that said like only this many day trial. It didn't even ask me to uh, put a number in or anything. Sometimes they'll ask you for a credit card or like, at, you know, on Apple, they'll make you like say one week trial and then it'll charge you money. Like it didn't even do that. So I'm hoping this is going to work. Uh, so the apps down here. And that's really all I have today.